the guest of the faculty and the uh, department. And so my goal is to be a good citizen and obey all local customs and practices. If I find that I am violating some in, something in here, if I find that I am violating any local custom or practice, I will you know, issue a correction. Um, uh, one of the local customs and practices that I understand to be the case is the grading distribution, which is about half the students get A's and about half the students get B's. And uh, you know, hopefully no one will require people going below it. Okay, if you do the stuff, you participate willfully, that hopefully won't happen. Um, but make sure that that's the case. Um, any questions about the grading policy? Anything like that? Um, the web co court page for the course, I wrote it in the um, syllabus. But let's just make sure we understand it. It's going to be, um, actually, it's I wrote it incorrectly in the syllabus. HTTP slash slash www dot CSE dot you're at US we're at, at UST dot HK that was my mistake okay slash Tilda Skeena my name is Stephen Skeena S K I E N A slash five ten so what I'm hoping you will see there are all the course handouts, all the course lectures. Um, second thing, we have a, a TA, okay, where's our, our TA, okay, uh, Zeng, okay, Zeng Yu Yi, okay, stand up, give him, everyone give him a round of applause. Okay, he will be the TA, he will be responsible for grading your homeworks and um, stuff like that and helping out with other aspects of the course. So, um, so you know, so, so, so. He took the course, a version of this course that was offered here last year and did very well, so he knows something, okay? And uh, don't be afraid to talk to him. Um, the textbook for the course is going to be this book by Hull on um, options, uh, futures, and other derivatives. This is a very popular book in, the, in business schools around the world on options pricing. I would say I, I believe this is the most popular book in that field, and I find it pretty readable. Okay, so I encourage uh, as the required book. This is, I guess, supposed to be in the bookstore. Is that the way it works here? And um, it's a nice paperback. Uh, I checked; it's supposed to be within the price budget of people here. I encourage people who are interested in the course to buy the book and uh, read it and stuff like that. Any questions about this book? Okay, if you have access to an older edition, it's not a big problem. Okay, but I do encourage people to read the book. Um. There are some other books that I have on reserve at the library. I gather that's the other convention here, is that, that, that people do have recommended references, and uh, they put it on reserve. Um, one book that uh, I would like to sort of recommend, because it's a little surprise, just a couple weeks ago I discovered this book, a book called Paul Wilmont's Introduction, Introduces Computational Finance, which I've grown quite fond of. Okay, This has a... Uh, Fairly idiosyncratic way of teaching things. There are a lot of um, you know funny cartoons which are the, normally annoy me terribly. Okay, and so normally I would not recommend books like this. I would use it as strike against it. But actually, I have found that that a lot of his explanations are interesting and meaningful. And so you might want to consider looking at that. I put it on reserve in the library. Um, another book. That is, I understand, uh, and on reserve on the library is this book by Say on financial time series analysis. When we get to that part of the class, some of the material would come from there, okay? But um, and so you may want to read that um, if you wish. Um, I put a book on uh, online algorithms on reserve in the library also. And finally, I put a copy of my book on reserve in the library. You have a very good library. One way to tell is that it had copies of all of my books that I'd written, okay? Um, but uh, I, I encourage, this is a fun book to read. It'll take you an evening. It's, and uh, if you just want to see where my head is and get some idea as to how these models work or something like that, it might be fun reading, although this is by no means required or, rec you know, or uh, necessary. Any questions? Okay, um, fair enough. And um, the other thing that we talked about, just to, to go back here, um, the, uh, I would like people to come by soon if you're interested in giving presentations. Try to form up, pick a partner, and uh, 
you know, get together for a presentation and come and tell me so I can get you a topic and you can get started on that. Um, I'd also like a few volunteers to be um, part of the class, what I would call rapid response team, okay? What is a rapid response team? It's a group of people whose job is to respond rapidly. By that, what I mean is that fairly often there might be a question that will come up in class. We'll talk about something about, oh, how, uh, you know, stocks are better investments long term than treasury bills, okay? It would be great if somebody could go and um, run through a financial database, go get, download some data, produce a graph in Excel or using Perl or something, new, new plot, something like that. So we add something to talk about. Maybe we'll come back and, and, and run little experiments on a regular basis to test how the talk about matches reality. If you're interested in doing that, I'd be very happy to talk to you guys right after class or as soon as you guys could shape up. Somebody would like to volunteer for that. Any questions? And that would be your course project for the semester is to be, to be available for that. Any questions? Okay. Any other questions about the background of, the, of what we're going to be covering in here? That all that is meant to be course introduction. And if there's no questions about anything else, at that point I'll get into sort of financial material. Any questions? Okay, um, so we're going to talk in here, and we talk about finance. Finance is in some sense about investing, okay? And um, one thing that, uh, you know, so, so I'm going to go through sort of some, some basic questions about uh, what investments are, how markets work, things like that. If any of this is new or you have any questions, it is good to um, ask questions about it and for there to be discussions here. It is going to be far more meaningful if there are some kind of discussions than if I am just reading off my slides to you. Um, and um, the other thing that I always find is that it is more, I personally think it is the introductory stuff is usually more important than the advanced stuff, okay? It's important to understand what risk is versus return more often than details of a complicated model, okay? So it's important that you understand this kind of material that we're going to talk about when we discuss it if there's any questions. Um, but one of the, uh, you know, what is the need to know about investments? Investments um, are, you know, you put money into some kind of an investment in the hope of getting more money back from it. That is what, as I understand, an investment is. Um, now, the return on the investment, by that we mean how much profit you make on it, okay, or how much um, expected profit might you make from it, okay, is strongly related to the risk. Cash is a very simple investment, right? You take money, you stick it in a mattress, okay? That is so long as you have a safe, you know, you lock the door of your room, that is a very safe investment. But the return on your money sitting in the mattress is zero, right? You put it into a safe but low yielding investment, like let's say United States Treasury bills, or have historically been considered to be an extremely safe investment, okay? Um, but they typically will pay something on the order of 3%, 4%, something like that. Now, why is it that United States Treasury bills are considered to be safe, okay? Now again, people may change, as, we, as, I, as I give this talk, people may have different opinions and in time it may be changing. Why is it that United States Treasury bills are historically deemed safe? Okay. Any reasons? Okay. One is historically the United States was deemed a powerful enough country and big enough country that it was trustworthy, that if you loaned it money, okay, it was going to pay it back. Okay. It's particularly true, okay, because the United States Treasury can print its own money, right? So they can always guarantee that they will give you your money back, okay? Now maybe what's, what's historically been the case is also that, 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 that people have respected the value of the dollar. It's been pretty consistent, right? And um, that's another reason why it's been considered to be a safe investment. And because it's a safe investment, people would loan it money at a very, with, with expecting very little return, okay? Again, things may or may not be changing, okay? The return on something like an a, a treasury bond or something like that, we call it interest rate, okay? And the interest rate on a loan, whenever you make a loan or buy, get a loan, 
there is typically associated with it an interest rate. Okay? This is saying how much percentage yield do you expect back in regard for giving this loan. Okay? Now, um, the interest rate you pay depends upon many things. Okay? If I'm going to borrow money and I'm going to borrow it for a long time, okay, should I expect to pay a higher percentage rate than if I, if I pay it a low, borrow it for a low time? And I, I said that very badly. Let's take a look at it. Suppose I want to come and borrow money, okay? In one case, maybe I want to borrow it for a year. In another case, I will bar, want to borrow it for 30 years. Which should I expect to pay more for? 30 years. Well, that seems obvious, okay. But what about on a per year basis, okay? Certainly over the course of the loan. If let's say I borrow it at, you know, 5%, 5% after, if I borrow 100 year, one, $1 for, you know, $100 for one year at 5%, I would pay $5 total interest, okay? If I borrow it for 30 years, if I pay that percent per year, I will clearly be paying a lot more total interest. But more to the point, the rate which I will be paying my interest on should be higher in, if I am borrowing the money for 30 years. Why is that? The main reason is because it's riskier. Right now, maybe in, for a year, you'll believe I'll have a job and be able to pay you back in a year. But 30 years from now, I'll be old. I won't have a job. Okay, I may not be able to, you know, a lot of bad things can happen in 30 years, right? So the risk on an investment for 30 years is higher than the risk for a shorter term period. So generally the interest rates would be higher. Okay, any questions? And this would be borne out by historical things. If you took a, put a $1 investment in short term treasury bills in 1925, it would have gone up to about $10, okay, by the year 2000, okay? Where if you would put it in long-term treasury bills, it would have gone up to be about twice that, $19. Does everybody get that principle? Any questions about that? Again, I welcome questions, even if they're seemingly silly questions or anything like that. It's good for there to be interaction here. Another thing you can invest in are stocks, okay? Any questions about this? Okay? Another thing you can invest in are stocks, okay? What is a good thing about investing in stocks? You can buy shares of Google, okay, or Microsoft, okay? What, why are they good? Well, in general, on average, historically, stocks will pay a higher return than loaning money to the U.S. government will. Why is that? Because there is more risk, okay? And that there's in general a risk and reward principle, okay? If you look at, um, you know, if you put it in major stocks over this time period, um, the, the one dollar investment in major stocks grew to six hundred dollars over that time period, which was much better. Now one thing to note is something bad happened after 1999, okay? So that pro number probably wouldn't be as good today as it was back then, okay? But get the basic idea that there's a trade-off between risk and return, okay? If you buy lousy companies, let's think about it. If you buy companies that are on the verge of bankruptcy, would your expected return be higher or lower than if you're buying them in stable companies? It should be, your return should in principle be higher buying companies that look like they're on thin air, thin, on, on, you know, shaky financial ground than if you are buying, um, you know, buying um, stable companies. Right now in the United States, General Motors is in big trouble, right? Okay, Toyota, very stable car company, right? which would likely provide a higher return on average expected over an infinite number of lifetimes? The answer is probably the riskier one. On the other hand, you know, so there's a trade-off between risk and return, okay? Any questions here? The other thing to note is the value of these returns depends upon, you know, is it good 
that a dollar's worth of investment in blue chip stocks went to $600 75 years later. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, it depends a lot upon, I mean, are you now a rich person if you made that investment? Okay? A lot of that depends upon what the relative value of money is now and then. We live in a world of, where there is always constant inflation. Money is worth less with time. Okay, this is an important principle. Okay? In principle, because of inflation, typically inflation is 3%, something in that regard. That means every dollar that you own now is worth less, okay, in terms of purchasing power as time goes by. Any questions about that? So, what about, what are markets, okay? Many of you have heard about, you know, obviously everyone here, I trust, no, has heard of stocks. I trust everybody here has heard of financial markets. But what are financial markets? The ones that I am used to dealing with or, or hearing about are the New York Stock Exchange and the NASDAQ. Those are the major ones in the United States. What are the major ones out here? Hang Sen Index, right? Okay, probably there are other ones out here. Any other? GM? What is that one? So GM, is that, is that, that's a local exchange for? Okay, so it may very well be, again, I don't know, Hang Seng may very well be for the relatively established companies out here, okay? And there probably is an in, is a exchange, the GM index, I'm going to say, where, uh, which, is, which is tracking, um, which, which is listing stocks that are newer, more speculative, less established, okay? So what is an exchange? An exchange is basically a place where stocks can get traded. That is, if you think about what is actually an exchange doing. I think exchanges do a lot of different things. And it's important to understand a little bit about what an exchange does. One thing it does is it provides a market for where you can buy and sell shares in a particular company. In general, each company is listed on one exchange. Okay? Historically, in general. Okay? What does that mean? That means that if you want to buy shares in General Motors, you have to go to the New York Stock Exchange because all trading in principle in the New York Stock Ex in General Motors is historically done on the New York Stock Exchange. So what does that mean? Okay? Basically, you know, there, there, there's, there is a, the exchange provides some kind of a mechanism where you can specify that you want to buy this thing or that you want to sell shares that you, that, that, that you already own, okay? And the purpose of the exchange is to make the connection between the buyers and the sellers. Does that make sense? It's also to make sure that, um, that, that the exchange, it's also important that the exchange enforces certain rules, okay? Why is it that they were riskier stocks traded on the GM, if I'm going to understand this correct, the GM exchange? Then the Hang Seng Index exchange. The reason is because probably companies have to achieve certain levels of size, certain levels of stability, before the Hang Seng Index will agree to trade them. Okay? So there's different amounts of regulation on different kinds of exchanges. And that's one reason why there exist different exchanges. Okay? That's kind of an important thing to realize. Any questions about that? Okay? The other thing is that the world of trading and mark financial markets and how you actually physically go about buying a, a share of stock has gotten more complicated in recent years. There are, you know, it used to be that these markets were done by people getting together. If you wanted to buy GM, you physically went to the booth for GM at the New York Stock Exchange and yelled, I want to buy some of this stuff. Now. It, a lot of it is done electronically. Almost all of it is done electronically. And there are other venues for trading stocks. Okay? There are some exchanges offer after-hour trading, which is somehow, or there will be other pools of stock where people you can trade in principle with people after the main exchanges are closed. There are some other venues called dark pools where certain companies will trade among themselves without going to the exchange. Okay? And so the actual mechanism in a big 
financial house. So how do you actually buy? You decide you want to buy some stock. I want to buy some General Motors. Exactly how that order gets executed or should get executed to get the right price, the best price, can be a complicated business. Any questions about that? Okay. Now, the main thing that a exchange provides is this notion of liquidity. What is liquidity? How many people have heard the word liquidity? Many people. What is it? Okay. What? Money capital? Well, that's not completely, it could be that the size of a market you're seeing is liquidity. That's not quite it, okay? I could own something very, very, that's worth hundreds of millions of dollars, but it wouldn't be very liquid, okay? What is liquidity? Easy yeah. to flow. What? Easy to flow. Easy to flow, it's like liquid, money flow, the water flows out easily, right? In a liquid market, money flows easily. Okay, and this is actually an important thing to understand, okay, is that um, if you have a liquid market, if I want to sell my General Motors, okay, I could be able to say sell it and there should always, there would always be a buyer there who would pay me what the market, is, what, 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 what the shares are really worth, what the going rate on the market is, right? Certain things are not liquid investments. My mother, back in the United States, is trying to sell a house, okay? A house is an example of a not very liquid investment. Why is that? The house may be worth, you know, you know, certain $300,000, let's say, okay? But she has to find a buyer, and it is not easy to find a buyer for it, okay? Someone has to physically walk in and look at the place and decide. So, so... Certain markets are liquid, certain markets are not, okay? And one of the things that exchanges provide and that makes stocks good is in principle it's a liquid market. There's always a lot of buyers and sellers, or almost always a lot of buyers and sellers. And problems happen when, they, when there is not liquidity. Any questions? Okay. Again, we talked about regulations, okay? Exchanges have different levels of regulation. Okay, as we talked about here, these regulations are interesting for a couple of reasons. One, they affect the quality of the company that is traded on it. If I wanted to form a new company, Digiscan, okay, which was you know a, a small enterprise that's uh, you know maybe not completely reputable, I could I might say, oh, I'd like to sell shares on the Hang Seng index, but Hang Seng probably would not let me on there. Perhaps the GM index would, okay? And so the question about what the quality of the accounting rules and how much information is released about what the company is doing, these are rules that are regulated by exchanges. And sometimes certain exchanges have, you know, stocks where more is known about than others, okay? Any questions about that? The other thing that, that exchanges do that they differ on that's kind of important are the mechanisms by which they match buyers to sellers, okay? So in principle, in a, in a, a reasonable exchange, perhaps if I want to buy, sell my stock, I have to put my stock, my, I want to sell 100 shares at a price of $50. Perhaps I have to put that on a queue, okay? And the first person who comes along who's willing to pay $50, that order should be matched with the one that is oldest on the queue. Some exchanges may work at things in a different way. Perhaps if I'm a more privileged seller, my stock should get sold ahead of yours even though you were in line ahead of me, right? Certain exchanges will have different rules for how they match buyers to sellers, okay? And that's one other reason why exchanges matter, okay? Any questions? Okay. So why is it that companies issue stock? Okay? What is stock? Just to make sure it's, we have it as an abstraction. Okay? Stock is in principle a fraction of a company. When you own 100 shares of General Motors, you are owning 0.0000157% 
of the company General Motors. Is that concept clear to everybody? So when you ask what a company, what a um, share of stock is worth, how should you price it? What governs how much a share of stock is worth? Any ideas? How would you go and say General Motors is now trading for $13.53 a share today? Why is it trading for $13.53 a share? Okay. Is it because of the financial prospects of that company? Partially. Okay. What is the major reason why it is trading for $13.53? Okay. It has to do with supply and demand. Okay? That a stock is in principle worth what somebody is going to pay for it. This is the important thing. Okay? When there was a big bubble, and I, I always think about the internet bubble in the United States. Um, you know, you had companies that were worth, were, were, the stock was trading for extremely high values. Okay? Why was there... Why was Amazon.com selling for $200 a share at one point, or $400 a share at one point? The reason was supply and demand. Enough people thought it was worth that, okay? And that, that, was, that was sort of a stability point where price, sellers equal buyers, okay? That said, why is there a certain price? Why is there an equilibrium price? In theory, it has to do with what the earnings of that company share will be. When you own a fraction of the um, company, you in principle own a certain fraction of all future profits that company will make. So if you want an abstract reason for what a share of stock is worth, okay, it has to do with what the financial returns of the company are. Okay, but in principle, for our purposes, we're not really going to talk about dividends or, um, let's say, balance sheets or any of these kinds of things in this course. The price of a stock is basically what it is worth, what, what people are willing to pay for. It. Any questions about that? Any other questions about markets? Okay, and that's basically what I'm saying here. In principle, there are fundamentals of an industry. And if you take a course in accounting, okay, or you go over to the business school, there will be lots of people who will try to figure out what a company is worth, okay, based on how much of a profit is it making, what is it selling, what is the fate of its industry. We are not going to talk about any of that kind of stuff. For us, basically, the price of a stock is determined by what people are paying, willing to pay for it. Okay? Any questions? The other thing to note is that if there were not differences of opinion, okay, in the value of something, like a share of stock, there would be very little trading done in it. Let me take a look. Let me give you a little proof of this. Okay? It's somehow what drives markets is the difference of opinion. Here I have a $20 Hong Kong bill, right? How many people would give me, would, would buy this bill for $19? Okay, you would want to buy it for $19. Very good. How many people here would want to buy it for $21? No one. Okay. How many people here would buy it for $20? Here's the more interesting question. Okay. The answer here is no one. Why not? Okay. The reason really is because there is no difference of opinion in what this is worth, right? If there was a difference of opinion, you people in the back of the room would be madly trading back and forth $20 bills, right? Okay? So what's interesting is that a lot of this case there are values of things. We're going to be dealing a lot with how much are securities valued, okay? That's going to be when we talk about pricing options. We're trying to figure out what the price of these things are. Okay? In general, if there was not a disagreement in what the prices of, of these things were, the values of them, they would not be much traded. Any questions? Okay? Okay. Um, 
How many people here, we, we, I hear, you hear in the newspaper about the Hang Seng Index, okay, or that's, I guess, you know, or stock indices. What does the Hang Seng Index or any other stock index? Does anyone know what a stock index is? Okay. What was it? Good question. Right. A, a, a stock index is in some sense sort of like a portfolio of stocks, okay? It is a collection of stocks, okay, that is specified. It is a, each of which has a stock with a particular weighting. How much percentage of it do you own, okay? And when people talk about a stock index, what they are talking about, let's say the Dow Jones, and the Dow Jones or the Hang Seng Index, what they are talking about are what are the returns of a particular group of stocks, a particular, you know, that's what we mean by an index. Now when you look at stock prices in a market, okay, um, <coughs> stocks go up and down every day, okay? Do they move in unison? This is one question that's kind of interesting for us, okay? The answer is, I mean, you know, if you hear there's an up day in the market or a down day in the market, Stock prices in principle reflect the uh, performance of individual companies, correct? And yet there are days when they all go up and they all, almost all go up and days when they all go down, okay? In general, if you look at the movement of stock prices, okay, um, what you end up getting is that roughly 70% of a stock prices movement, stock price Typical stock, if you look at its movement, there is a strong correlation between any stock's price movement and the fate of the whole market. Why is that? Okay? Anybody think of why that might be? Okay? So if you look at Google's stock market price, Google is an interesting stock, okay? And it will go up and down wildly. But its fate is going to be tied a lot to the fate of other stocks. Why is it? Because a lot of the financial, um, what do you call it? a lot of the, let's say, things that reflect the performance of a company, reflect things that are happening in the outside world, correct? The price of oil is the same for every company. And so if you have a company whose price, where the price of oil is important, okay, then if the price of oil goes up, those stocks will go down, like airline stocks. Okay, whenever the price of airline, whenever airline stocks go up, I mean, the price of oil goes up, airline stocks go down. There are system, so, so a lot of these movements, there are a lot of correlations. And perhaps the biggest dependency that all these stocks have depends upon interest rates. Has anybody ever heard, you know, when you listen to a commentator on the radio or on the TV, they talk about it. Somebody makes a pronouncement about interest rates. The moment someone says interest rates just went up, they raised the prime rate by a quarter of a point, immediately the price of all other stocks adjusts to that. Okay? That's really kind of an amazing phenomenon. Okay? That, you know, if the head of the Federal Reserve in the United States says interest rates are going up by a quarter point now, instantly large numbers of stocks will drop their price. Okay? And so a lot of their movements are reflect the market, and we'll see why there is such a strong dependence with interest rates. It's not just a random thing, but there's a reason, meaningful principle as to why that happens. There's a certain amount of price movement that is due to the individual weirdnesses of the stock, okay? If things that are happening that look good for Google in the world, Google's stock price will happen, will raise. If there is a fire at Yahoo, it starts to burn down some of Yahoo, okay? Google's stock price will go up, right? Okay, Yahoo's price will go down, okay? But the biggest phenomena, so I think what we're trying to say here, maybe more, more that's going to get interest to us later on in the course, we would expect correlations between stock prices, okay? Movements of stock prices, correlating to things that happen to the society at large, like interest rates, and correlations of things within industries, okay? And there are also movements due to weirdnesses of, of individual stocks. 
Any questions? And looking at what the implication of this thing is for investment is one of the things we'll talk about when we talk about trading strategies. Okay? How do you build a portfolio that will give you a good return while minimizing risk? Okay? That is, that, that is the kind of a question that's sort of an important question. Any questions? Okay. Again, my, I'll talk about my investment advice for the last time. Okay? In general, if you want to invest in stocks, what is considered to be the best way to do it is to f track a broad major stock index. In the United States, something like the Vanguard 500, which tracks the S&P 500. Undoubtedly, there are indices you can buy, products here that track the Hang Seng Index, or anything like that. Why is this a good thing to do with your money? Well, we said that most stock movements correlate with the movement of the general index fairly strongly, right? So in some sense, you're capturing most of what is going on with stocks when you buy in part of an index. You don't have to pay a lot of smart people to try to help you pick the best stocks. So the expenses of running one of these index funds is very low, which means that, that more of your money, the, the returns from the stocks go to the investor. Okay? And um, historically, very few investors do a better job of picking which stocks will go up and down than the market itself, okay? Which is an argument that if you cede the decisions to the market by buying an index fund, you're in general capturing the wisdom of the market, and it's not clear that individual people are smarter than that, okay? Any questions about this? Okay? This is one reason why we're, most of what we're going to be talking about is not about stocks, Okay, but about derivatives on stocks, where things are more complicated to price, and there is more room for, let's say, smarts and, and, and understanding differences of prices, and smarter people figuring things out better than other people. Any questions? Okay. Any other questions about anything we've said here so far? Okay. One other mechanism about um, stocks that we're going to be using when we talk about arbitrage, there is going to be a concept here of short sales. Okay? Normally, if I think Google is going to go up, what should I do? I think Google's got great prospects. Something's going to happen to Google like that fire. I'm ready to set fire to Yahoo. Okay? <laughs> okay? What should I do to profit from this information? Buy Google. That much is clear. Okay, at least right now it's to buy Google. Okay? Now what on the other hand should I do with Yahoo? Okay? I know that Yahoo is going to, you know, have, if I'm going to set fire to Yahoo, okay? They are about to go down. How can I profit from this information? Okay? And this is where the notion of short sales come in. Okay? And this is a, a, a trickier business. Okay? If I own Yahoo, the smart thing to do is to sell it. That's fine. Okay? But in principle, I could only take advantage of my knowledge of the future, or my, my, my speculation about the future. In that case, if I owned it already. With a short sale, what I'm basically going to do is borrow somebody's shares. Okay? Borrow may be the wrong word. Perhaps I'll spay, spend, I'll, I'll, I'll rent them from you, okay? But I will basically say I will give you share. Your, give me your shares now, and I'll give them back to you in a year, okay? Then what am I going to do with your shares? I'm immediately going to sell them, okay? Now what's the problem? Now I've got money. This is great, okay? The only problem is now at some future time perhaps a year from now, I have to give you back your shares. Does everybody see that? So at this point, I've got to go buy shares in the market to give back to you. Okay? So if the price drops in the meantime, what has happened? Okay? I have made money from this deal, right? I borrowed 100 shares of, of Yahoo. 
which I sold for $2,000. Okay? Yahoo plunged, and now it's only worth $10 a share. I can buy back those shares, okay? And for only $1,000. So my profit at the end of the transactions would be the difference between that, or in this case, $1,000. Any questions about this mechanism? Okay? Now, why might somebody loan you shares? Let's think about it. This is maybe a bigger question. Okay? Biggest reason would be, again, if they rent them to you. Okay? You could imagine that, that if somebody has shares of stock that they're not planning on, that they're not going to sell for a long time, perhaps they could make a little bit of money on the side by renting it out to you. For example, I have a certain amount of stock that is in my pension plan. The person who runs my pension plan knows that I am not going to get old for another 20 years, right? I can't retire for a certain point. There are shares of stock that are sitting there, okay, that aren't needed in some sense until much later, okay? So that is basically what short selling is, okay? And it's a private mechanism to, to bet on things going down. Any questions about that? Okay. Now, different markers, markets differ on the rules regarding short selling. Some people think it is evil to be able to bet on a stock price going down. For example, it provides incentive for you to burn down Yahoo's factory. Okay? Provides incentive for you to say nasty things about the company and spread rumors, okay, that it will go bad, right? It provides incentive to pile on them if they're going down now, to keep them going down and really crashing. So different markets have different rules about governing what kind of short sales they allow and stuff like that. Okay? But the basic mechanism of short sales should be clear. Any questions? Okay. Um, let me talk. Okay, let me. I'll, I'll, I'll finish up in a minute. But um, one other kind of investment. Okay, any other questions about stocks? I've got four minutes. So you can either keep me in talk, we can talk about stocks for a few minutes or I'm going to go on. Any questions about anything related to how financial stock markets work, what stocks are? Any questions? Okay. So there are other kinds of markets out there. Okay? One of the um, important types of markets that exist are, are bond markets. What are bonds? Bonds are loans. Okay? And this is maybe a more complicated thing to talk about. Okay? So what a bond market is, is a way of trading a loan, okay? So what is a, a, a notion here? If everyone understands, I think, the basic concept of a loan, okay? A loan is, I want $100, you have $100, okay? We make an agreement where you give me $100, okay? And um, I will pay you 5% interest on that, right? Now, once we have that agreement, okay, that agreement has value, okay? Not so much the loan money going back and forth, but the agreement for the loan borrowing, okay? Let's be precise here. Suppose, let's say, he has, a, he has loaned me $100 with the promise that I will repay it in a... Uh, you know, in a year, okay? Now, if I were to tell you that, in fact, I am going to be leaving the country in six months, okay? The probability that he will get paid is less. Does everybody agree with that? The value of him, of that $100 I owe him, is less than it was before. Does everybody kind of get that idea? So when people talk about bonds, People talk about loans, okay, and the ability to somehow trade the loan that he made, okay, off to somebody else is a very powerful thing, okay? So in some sense, if he wants to minimize his risk about being paid from me, one thing he could do is sell that loan to you, okay? 
And maybe he thinks that if he, if he thinks there's only a half chance of him getting paid back, it'd be worth it to him to sell the right to get my money back for $75. Okay, even though I, in principle, owe $100. And the ability to trade these loans back and forth, these sort of bond markets, are very important. Okay? Because they improve the liquidity of these things. He's happier to loan out money knowing that he could sell this loan in case he needed the money back quicker or he decided he didn't like me as much. Okay? So these bond markets and the ability to sell these loans are important things. Okay? And we'll talk more about this in other markets starting next class. Any questions about that? Okay, thanks for listening, and um, this is the end of class time. Am I correct about how I read it? Is this the official end of class? Okay, thanks for your attention. Make sure you pick up a syllabus. Make sure you um, get the sign-up sheet, and um, make sure that uh, you, uh, if you're interested in being on the rapid response team, you come and talk to me. Okay, thank you.